web of conspiracy. Here is your host, Adam Webb. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of the Web of Conspiracy. I am your host, Adam Webb, uh, coming to you live today for the first time in a while. I'm recording a live episode. Um, uh, first off, and in, in before I get uh, too far ahead, um, just want to uh, thank everybody for coming back to the show, for everyone supporting the show. It's awesome. Uh, wouldn't be doing this without people listening. And the moment that people stop listening is the moment I stop doing this. So uh, once again, thank you to all those who keep coming back and supporting the show. Um, I'm going a little off a little bit of the plan subject. I know that in my last episode I had planned on discussing cryptids, um, but I felt like I needed to change uh, pace a little bit. I needed to go in a different direction, and there was at least one particular story that I hadn't given a whole lot of attention to as of late, and I felt like I needed to address it. I considered doing two shows this week, uh, unfortunately, just didn't see how I could manage to fit uh, the time to do two uh, shows. So uh, I've decided I'm just going to bump back uh, doing the, the show on cryptids, so to speak. I plan on doing a couple different cryptids in the, in the episode. But uh, nevertheless, I decided to go into a direction I've kind of strayed away from a little bit in an effort to, you know, the thing about this show, the thing that I've always loved about doing this show, my plan for this show has been to discuss a variety of topics and to talk about um, the paranormal, the unexplained, but also to talk about government conspiracies and things of that nature. And I kind of have moved away from that a little bit. And I really wanted to get back into uh, talking a little bit more about that. And going into the month of May, I certainly plan on doing a little bit more as well. Uh, nevertheless, I really felt like this was the appropriate time to uh, kind of touch upon something that has been a personal, uh, more or less what I do when I'm not doing this show. And uh, those of you who know, I, I've been a historian. Uh, I'm a policy analyst at the moment. And what I really my passion has been has been uh, democracy and for those of you who um, have gone back and listened I know I did a, a greatest hits from a show that I did in the old network and I re-released it to a certain degree on this show uh, probably back in I think it was the end of December and I felt like I needed to touch on democracy a little bit again in particular what I believe is the decline and possible fall of democracy and, and this is not just in the United States but uh, throughout the Western world, uh, and certainly this is a problem, and I, I will get into that in greater detail as the show goes on, but for me, uh, the decline of democracy is a huge threat to the long-term viability of humanity. Now, uh, I know there are some people who staunchly disagree with that, certainly those who are more of the socialist uh, belief system. Uh, nevertheless, I believe the moment that we begin to lose our freedoms and begin to lose our rights, um, we're on a slippery slope at that point. So uh, I will expand as I go on, but this has been a passion of mine. This is what I study. I study the changing nature of democracy, and I'm also looking for developing ways in which we can keep democracy strong, not only strong, but reinvigorate democracy in the Western nations. Uh, and, and hope to spread democracy, true spread of democracy, uh, to other nations, not necessarily through militarization and occupation. That is not the best way to spread democracy, not by any means. Uh, nevertheless, I felt like I needed to get onto this topic a little bit more and address what I believe are the real threats uh, in the United States and globally and, uh, and, and talk about one particular issue which has certainly um, come up in the news as of late, and there's lots of uh, turmoil here in the United States over it, so I'll, I'll discuss that briefly. Um, but a couple of little things I want to touch on, some news, other news items that I like to touch on, and, and I've been tracking, of course, the missing, the missing Malaysian Airlines flight. Uh, report came out today that 95% of the area has been searched, no plane. Now, uh, I, at this point, I don't know if we'll find it. And if that's the case, will we ever get any kind of resolution? I don't know. Uh, I said that I believed initially that uh, this plane has gone down in the ocean, and I still think that it's a possibility. However, the longer this goes, the more you begin to wonder. Uh, maybe there is something to all of the uh, conspiracies surrounding it after all. Nevertheless, 
there's still 5% of the ocean left uh, to, to track, so there's plenty of possibilities as to where it may be. Uh, we'll continue to monitor and hope that we can find some sort of uh, um, find some sort of resolution in the very least. That's the hope at this point. Um, also monitoring the situation uh, in the Ukraine with Russia. Um, interesting scenario that's going on there. Of course, uh, I know I had discussed. I think it was last week's episode. Um, the the uh, anti semite uh, propaganda material that was being spread throughout. Um, volatile situation and given Putin's position at this point to me it would appear that Putin really is harkening back to the old imperial Russia days now uh, I know many people look at this as, as well he's trying to recreate the Soviet Union and, and to a certain degree that may be true but I really think that this goes back a little bit more to the imperial days of Russia uh, where I think he sees himself in this vein of the Tsar more or less uh, which is a little different than, uh, say, the Soviet premier was. Um, nevertheless, I think that he's really looking to establish a, an imperial Russia uh, to a certain degree. And uh, so we'll continue to monitor that. And, of course, there's conflicts with the rebels, so to speak, uh, in Ukraine. Um, volatile situation. And uh, I, my hope is that it doesn't escalate. But in the same respect, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that uh, the Ukraine will be the Ukraine that we've known. It, it would appear that, at least by all accounts, that the individuals who live there want to be part of Russia. So, in in the Crimea and some of those areas in the east. So, uh, we'll continue to keep an eye on it. I'll continue to talk about an update as that goes. And uh, hope that this doesn't slip into an, a situation where we start getting... Uh, um, you know, perhaps some human rights violations, of course, uh, and uh, as well as uh, a, 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 well, I don't want to say a bloody conflict because we're already getting uh, conflicts and clashes in the area, but it's certainly an escalated conflict. Okay, so uh, I, I've received some some emails and, and some and some other uh, comments uh, about another issue, and I wanted to kind of touch on this real quick. Um, my health condition. I know that I've had some people who've continued to send me well wishes and, and it's greatly appreciated and I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I actually am going for my first follow-up since my last appointment uh, here in, well, about a week and a half. So a little bit nervous about uh, about that. I'm not sure if I'm going to have to have any more surgeries done. Uh, with, with the type of cancer I had, melanoma, uh, you really have to look at the surrounding area, making sure that everything's clean. And and uh, the area where I had the melanoma, it, it was essentially a patch of freckles. So it's very difficult to discern. And the melanoma was caught early enough that everything's at a microscopic level. So it's not as if, though, um, you can just see what's going on. You can't. So nevertheless, uh, I'm going in for a follow-up and uh, going to check and see perhaps uh, I may need to have uh, you know maybe more surgeries and uh, even the possibility of a skin graft uh, still and that would be mostly out of a precaution believe it or not to make sure that everything is in fact gone um, my hope is that uh, that's not necessary my hope is that if there is another surgery required that I don't have to do that um, uh, so yes uh, I have a degree of, uh, of anxiety about the uh, upcoming situation uh, it's not been pleasant, but I've certainly enjoyed the last few months. I had my last surgery at the end of January, so I've enjoyed these last uh, well, three months without having a, <laughs> not having any parts of me cut off. So that's always good. <laughs> um, nevertheless, I'm hopeful, and as, as I've stated before, um, everyone everyone at this point seems to have every reason to believe that this was caught early. Um, it was caught at stage one, which is excellent. Um, melanoma is potentially treatable and potentially curable if caught early and taken aggressive enough actions. And I'd had a sentinel lymph node biopsy done in the area where uh, basically they inject uh, radio, you know, these radioactive material into your body, a little bit of it, uh, and look to see if the lymph nodes, which lymph nodes take in this material. And that's where you have to check to see, in the case of melanoma, where it may have spread. And uh, having had that done uh, at the initial diagnosis and initial surgery, um, the 
closest lymph node was only one lymph node was affected, and that lymph node turned out to be negative for cancer. So it did not spread. It was literally caught. It appears to be just in time. So I'm very fortunate, and at this point it's a matter of staying ahead and being precautious. I, I live more like a vampire these days. Uh, certainly have to avoid the sun uh, as much as possible, um, but I'm alive, and uh, I'll take that over the alternative at this point because I'm certainly not prepared to, uh, to pass on yet. So once again, thank you for everybody who continues to wish me their support and offer their, you know, their kind thoughts and prayers. And it is greatly appreciated uh, at times having a diagnosis like that, especially early on, uh, can be uh, very scary. You know, you hear cancer and immediately your thoughts go to, well, am I going to die? Because you hear so many stories of people who die from cancer. Um, you don't really hear enough about the survivors and those who continue to survive on for years and and uh, my my hope is to certainly be one of those so once again i uh, just want to thank everybody for their kind uh, words and thoughts and prayers uh, when it comes to uh, my treatment so okay moving on to the uh, topic the gist of what the show is really about for me uh, here today um, i'd had a number of uh, of listeners uh, email or send me messages on social media uh, in, in regards to the uh, situation that occurred in Nevada at the uh, Clive uh, Bundy Ranch and uh, what's he his current situation with the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, there was a conflict approximately what I think almost two week well two weeks ago now, um, where the federal government claimed that uh, Bundy was using land that was owned by the, by the federal government to uh, that he had his cattle grazing on for 20 years and uh, they filed him with a million dollar fine and uh, they wound up um, you know, closing off and, and, and actually taking some of his cattle. This led to a, a showdown with uh, Bundy and uh, several, I, I think it was over a thousand militia that had come to support him and uh, led to a showdown that ultimately led to Bundy uh, having his cattle returned and the BLM backing down. Now, uh, at this moment in time, I, I don't believe that that is a permanent situation. I think that, the, that this is a temporary halt and I do think that it'll be really a matter of uh, going forward, uh, a matter of greater force. However, the federal government is going to have to tread carefully because the last thing they want to do is to incite another Ruby Ridge incident or Waco incident. Um, as we've seen in the past, that had inspired, those incidents inspired Timothy McVeigh to launch his terrorist attack on the uh, Oklahoma, uh, state of Oklahoma, the, the Oklahoma City Federal Building. Uh, so the government is going to have to tread carefully because they cannot afford to have another incident like this occur. They cannot afford to appear to be um, a, too aggressive. Nevertheless, I think that that's where, going, where we are going to head to inevitably as time progresses with the situation. Now, here's the situation. This, the, this issue with, with Clyde Bundy has been muddled a bit over the last few days over these reports of him using racial slurs and derogatory racial comments. Now, uh, for those of you who listen to the show know that I'm not a supporter of that, and I will not support that type of uh, attitude. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, the situation, in my opinion, the, in terms of what his comments were, those are his individual beliefs, and I don't have to support that. He's allowed to believe how he wants to believe, whether or not you, anybody, you, I, or anybody else believes that it's ignorant. Uh, he's allowed to think that way. That's the beauty of living in this country. Uh, that being said, I believe that much of what he said in terms of these derogatory comments are really more of a smokescreen. It's really more of an issue of let's divert the attention away from the real problem. Um, many would argue that the liberal media is the ones who, you know, blew this out of, you know, blew this whole thing up with the, the racial statements and things of that nature. And not that I'm trying to excuse it, but if you know any buddy from who is of that age it seems that that generation they still hold on to a lot of those ideals uh, it's unfortunate <clears throat> excuse me but nevertheless um, 
these ideals are still held on to by many. And I think that it's unfortunate that those have come out in the way that they have, and that it really diverts the attention away from the real issue, which is what, in my opinion, the media was really shooting for. Let's divert from the problem and create another problem that will gather uh, greater attention. And in this day and age, uh, using racial slurs, derogatory slurs of someone's race, ethnicity, um, religious beliefs, things of that nature, um, that garners, garners greater attention by the public. So, while I, I as I've stated, I, I'm not a, a, a supporter of necessarily his beliefs, I believe that we need to focus on the real issue here. Now, there are reports that the federal government is actually looking to sell this particular piece of land to a Chinese corporation that wants to build a solar energy plant there. Now, while I'm all in favor of solar energy, it's a little peculiar that land that has been designated to protect a uh, desert tortoise, I believe, is now possibly being sold in turn to a Chinese-backed corporation. The kicker in all of this is that one of the investors in this uh, group is the son of Senator Harry Reid, uh, who, needless to say, has come out and has argued that the individuals involved in, in, in the militia group that supported Bundy are domestic terrorists, that lovely term, domestic terrorists, that uh, basically says that if you disagree with anything that the federal government does, you are now a domestic terrorist. So, we have this issue of the derogatory terms come to fold, in the meantime, everyone's distracted and not really paying attention to the issue at hand. And I think the question that we really need to be asking ourselves is, why is the federal government buying up all of this land? And there are reports of the, of the federal government owning it, particularly in the West, the western part of the United States, where you know as much as 50%, in some cases even more, I know there's reports of the state of Nevada where this occurred, that the federal government owns almost uh, over 80-some percent of the land in the state. So we, what we have to ask ourselves is why is the federal government doing this? You know, almost 50% of the land in the state of Idaho. Okay, why? What is this really about protecting the natural environment? Well, if that is the case, then bravo. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that we're looking at a situation of that this is being done in a matter of let's protect the environment. Um, while, yes, the United States has made some efforts there, I don't believe that this is what it is about. I think this is about control of the land, control of resources, potentially natural resources, and exploiting them for the federal government's purposes. To me, this is also an issue of states' rights versus federal rights. You know, Clive Bundy, and once again, this is a little bit of a head-scratcher, doesn't recognize the federal government. He recognizes the state of Nevada's government. Well, okay, fine. Um, I would agree with that to a certain extent, that yes, you know, that what, we're, what we deal with in, in, in our unique structure, right, is that there's a question, and there's always been a question of federal versus state. We certainly have that in the issue of gay marriage, Okay, there are states that are opposed, there are states that are in favor, and the federal government uh, at this point in time would seem to be a little bit more in favor, but nevertheless, uh, there's still nothing coming down because that's always been, marriage has always been a case of state to state determination. And so, in that case, the state's governments have primacy, whereas this is a situation where the federal government is trying to claim to have primacy over the state of Nevada. So, a question of eminent domain, it's a question of who actually governs what? Does the state of Nevada hold greater claim there than the federal government? And I think there are many people who would say that yes, and that, the, that Nevada's laws should trump the federal government's laws. Um, and, and this has been a question, an age-old question, that, that we have been dealing with since the inception of our country. And this will not go away, not entirely. Um, we will continue to have these types of struggles going forward. Uh, I do think it's important that we lay some more definitive groundwork in terms of where the states have primacy and where the federal government has primacy. When you're talking about taking land that 
you know, Clyde Bundy, you know, believed that this was part of his family's land, that this land should not have been taken from him, that his family had been ranching it for years, and that the federal government had no rights to determine that he could no longer grace his cattle there. So here we are, a, a, a situation where we have armed agents that are sent to prevent him from well, at first they're taking his cattle, and then to prevent him from using this land. Now, it's a tricky situation because, yes, the federal government does claim to have this prop, this right, and in theory can do this. That being said, do they? Should they do this? Should they be allowed to do this? And in my opinion, the question really comes down to a, a matter of: Do we permit? our government to take actions against the people in this manner. We are seeing more and more where the federal government, and for that matter, governments at several different levels, are abusing individual rights of the people. To me, I look at this situation, I look at the escalation that occurred and what I think will occur. And once again, we're looking at the freedoms of the people being violated. Now, I know a lot of people like to criticize this Bundy as a welfare rancher. I've heard that term said by a number of individuals. And it's a, po it's a potentially fair criticism if you believe the federal government has the ability and should be allowed to do this. If you believe the federal government should not be permitted to do this, that the state of Nevada should be the one who determines who gets to use the land and for what reasons, then we're having a very different conversation. So it's really a matter of perception as to who you believe has the true claim to this land. I am immensely bothered by the amount of land the federal government owns, as well as should be any citizen in the United States. Because we don't really have an understanding of the motivation as to why this land is owned. We may be told that it's to protect the environment, but there's really no evidence to believe that the United States is really all that concern about our environment. Uh, we really have made no great efforts to reduce carbon gases in terms of automobile emissions. We are the second worst offender in the world behind China. Of course, China is an absolute train wreck. But if you're really concerned about the environment, you're going to make much greater uh, efforts. I don't buy that for a minute. And if anybody actually believes that, you really need to think this through a little bit. The federal government is concerned about itself and its well-being. That is its concern. Now, what we have seen is that the federal government is willing to do what it takes to support itself. And when I say that, and what I mean by that is, look at what at the NSA has done. We had no clue. And well, there were some that said, yes, this was happening. But of course, those people are on the fringe. They're crazy, right? The people who, are, who, 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 who predicted all this, they're the crazy ones. They're paranoid. They're, they, they've, they've read 1984 too many times. They're, they're the ones that are, you know, they're just, they've lost their minds. Well, as it turns out, they didn't. And the NSA has been monitoring everything that we've been doing. And were it not for the controversial person that is Edward Snowden, we wouldn't have any kind of definitive knowledge that this is the case. So this leads me to this leads me to my my big overall arching issue here. And that is the decline of the democracy in the United States. Yes, it is well, let me be very clear here. For I had know that I have listeners in Britain, I know that I have listeners in other democracies, uh, Australia, uh, and other free parts of the world. There are numerous studies that are proving that democracy is in decline. Okay, our freedoms are being restricted. The freedoms of the of the press, which I am very critical of, because I believe that many times it is controlled, are being squelched. They're being denied. We're not getting true access to the truth. We're being manipulated access. Okay. 
We're not getting all of the truth. We're not getting, in some cases, any of the truth about any kind of circumstance through the media. Certainly this can vary from media to media, and I'm not a fan of it. Unfortunately, you really have to look through and try to figure out who's telling the truth and who isn't, and it's hard to say, and it's unfortunate. It is very unfortunate. Unless you see something with your own eyes, and even then that's not always a guarantee that you know what you're actually seeing, there's no way to definitively know whether or not we're getting the truth. Our freedoms are being taken from us in the Western world. There is a contraction of freedom. Our privacy is being violated. We are facing several challenges to the, our way of life, and yet we don't really recognize, many of us don't even care. We're very apathetic to it. In the United States, executive orders are flying one after another, after another, after another. The president has gained too much power. Regardless of whatever his party is, the president, his, him or maybe eventually her, has too much power has far too much power, more power than what was ever given to the presidency by the founding fathers. Congressional committees in Congress have essentially come out of this effort to basically try to thwart some of the executive branch's authority. And you have Congress now trying to grab more and more power. It's a power struggle. And then let's not forget about the Supreme Court, which, for the record, was never supposed to determine policy in the United States. Never. Policy making is supposed to occur in Congress, not at the Supreme Court. And I think that we've all sort of forgotten this. I don't know if, 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 if people just didn't pay attention in school. Policy making is supposed to occur in Congress. That is where legislation is created. Yes, the Supreme Court will deal with cases as they come, but they are not supposed to be the ones to be the arbiters of the truth. That is a problem. They're not the arbiters of the truth in many cases. Certainly not the truth of everybody. The citizens vote for our representatives. In some cases, I don't know that we all vote very well, but we vote for people, and they're the ones who are supposed to represent our interests in terms of policy making. Unfortunately, for a number of different reasons, they don't. We have failures at every level of the federal government. Every level. And we are continuing down this path. There is a degree of responsibility that needs to be shared by almost everybody. Certainly the leadership. Leadership failure at an epic level. The people. I, I, I blame the people. I blame even myself from time to time. We have, we have permitted the situation to occur. We have not exercised to the fullest extent what we can. Now, that being said, before everybody jumps on me here, <laughs> I know that there are other influences going on here and that certainly hold great weight. The lobbies certainly being one of them. Okay, And there are others, other certainly other potential possibilities that talk about in conspiracy circles. Uh, there are no, uh, certainly the, the New World Order aspects, the concerns over uh, other secret societies, certainly Bilderberg, which I'm going to discuss here in a few weeks. Um, there is plenty of blame to go around. And 
that being said, I do believe that we still have the ability to take back some control. It's there. We've slipped into this gradual sort of decline. This didn't happen instantaneously. And, and, and for those of you know, my age, we can blame the generation before us and even the generation before them. The decline has been steady. And here we are now, and we're looking at living in a world where we're being monitored in everything we do. Everywhere we go, every conversation we have. Uh, after this broadcast, I'm most certainly going to be put on some sort of terrorist watch list. I would have no surprise if that were the case, despite the fact that I love this nation and that I would never in any way advocate any type of terrorist activity. That's not what I'm about. That being said, there are things that we can do to redirect the course of this nation, to redirect and regain and prevent the loss of further freedom. Just, just, just last week, there was a report that came out in a Princeton University study. The United States is no longer a democracy, it's an oligarchy. And for those of you who aren't familiar with from the oligarchy, it's essentially governance by the wealthy, by the powerful. Power begats itself. Wealth begats itself. It sustains itself. And it intermarries. And it creates families that have wealth, power, and influence. And we look at political dynasties that are established as a result. Certainly uh, the, the Kennedy family in the 1960s the Bush family it would even appear the Clintons you could you could put under this uh, category as well power begats itself the only way that you can overcome this is to find ways to create your own power Let me be clear. I, I, I've been rather pessimistic about a lot of things today. And I don't want that to be the over, overriding message. I believe that hope is not lost. I believe that we can, those of us in the West, take back control of what we've lost. Things are not lost. We can regain it. We can find it again. First off, the first key is civic engagement. We have to make a concentrated effort. We have to step away from our iPods, our iPads, our iPhones, our smartphones, our all of our little play devices. We have to step away from the TV. We have to step away from all of that just long enough to become involved, to get involved. And the key in this is local involvement because this, uh, for lack of, of, of a better term, term, this has to be a local movement. You have to start at a local level and work your way up. You have to be able to take control and, re and reorganize your neighborhoods. You have to find ways to reinvigorate your neighborhoods, your cities, before you can move on to the bigger things. We have to, if, if, if we're going to take back control... We have to organize at a local level and work our way up. We have to be able to reach those who haven't been listening. And that's the key. Those who don't realize that there's anything wrong. We have to reach those people. I have always been of the mindset that there's an extreme 20% at each end of the political spectrum. There are those who are diehard liberals, diehard conservatives, and will vote along whatever they believe their party line is, no matter what. And then I believe that you have the middle 60%. This middle 60%, particularly the United States, will move anywhere on that spectrum, depending upon the situation and depending upon the issue. We have to get involved. We have to get that 60% 60, 60 involved. The 40% in, 
and maybe even smaller than that number to be honest that's just a random guess it could be even smaller than that the 40 percent is dictating or in some cases i've heard some people argue 20 percent 10 percent on each end and really it's 80 percent that's in the middle and if that is indeed the case then the majority of americans are certainly not being well represented we have to get involved we have to do more we have to constantly assert our desires to our representatives and not only that but then we have to take it to the voting booths we have to vote again and i realize that uh, for many people it's picking a poison between two different candidates either you don't like him or you don't know either of them okay i get that but if you so if you don't know the individuals that are that are running for a particular office well that's on you because there's plenty of, of information out there even locally to be able to get that information make the effort if however you determine that you don't like either of them well then that's why we're in a situation where we're at because we have people who are the powerful and the wealthy the ones who can afford to launch these campaigns well they're the ones that uh, that will win the election by default so yes there does need to be campaign finance reform absolutely because it has uh, priced the not wealthy individuals out of politics the only way that you can get into politics now is if you have wealthy supporters if you yourself do not have wealth and that is very unfortunate another key aside from civic engagement campaign finance reform is we have to begin to really offer support to other parties true support don't listen to the to to the chatter on the left and the right well if you go support this party then you're just allowing the 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 people on the left to win if you if you leave the republican party then you're just allowing the left to win don't listen to that chatter because the democrats are saying the same thing to their to their more liberal leaning uh followers to not go support that that group in the center because you're abandoning votes and then the right will win it's all fear-mongering all of it we need a wider variety of representation in this nation the two-party system no longer truly supports the people in the middle it does not it has abandoned the people in the middle which make up the majority of this nation the people in the middle have been forgotten this cannot continue we have to start supporting other parties whether it's a green party whether it's a libertarian party whatever the case may be we have to offer different perspectives we have to offer place a viable place for those who are against abortion and are in favor of an expanded welfare system who does that person vote for what party do they do they align themselves with what party do those who are in in in, in support of abortion and are in well let's see in more of a favor of uh of individual rights well in many cases that's libertarian but the libertarian party doesn't have any kind of real traction at the moment we have to make a greater effort of establishing other parties we have to be able to find support for those parties we have to be willing to say okay i'm not going to cast my vote for somebody i will not support or for a party i will not support and i recognize that for many of you that may feel like you're initially throwing away your votes i get that however this is our best hope of being able to establish 
real traction for other parties. Not only that, but for those who can't afford it, supporting those parties financially. And I, real, I realize that in some ways, for many people, that's a scary proposition. And don't want to put your money into, in, into a political party. I get that. But if we want to have real choice and real freedom, we have to start having other parties. And I can tell you that other dem democratic nations in the West have multi-party systems that work much better than ours. Certainly Britain's. Now, I know that I would talk to a, a number of people from uh, Britain who would uh, argue that it's not perfect or ideal, and I'm sure it's not. I know it's not. But that being said, we need greater choice in the states. And the two-party system is preventing us from this. It is holding us back. So what else can we do to fix this problem? What else can we do to overcome this? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. Our greatest hope lies in the thing that many people fear as being our potential downfall, and that's technology. Me doing this right now, I'm hoping that I just hoping beyond hope that I reach somebody who says, you know what, maybe I do need to rethink this. If I can just reach one person to saying, okay, this isn't what we're doing is not working anymore. The, 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 the path that we've proceeded down through the 20th into the 21st century, we have to readjust. I'm not saying we have to take this thing back to the 1800s. But what I am saying is that we need to reassert our power in a democracy. Okay. The United States is a constitutional republic. This is true, but it's based on democratic principles. We have to reassert those democratic principles. And we have the ability to do that through the use of technology. We have an outlet that can give us far more power than our grandparents, our great-grandparents, or our great-grandparents could ever have dreamed of. We can reach people across the nation and around the world in a manner that was never dreamed of 50 years ago. The average person can do this now. So we have to start organizing. And yes, I realize that there's a lot of anxiety about doing it over the internet because everything we do is tracked. This is true. And I, I recognize that fear. However, this instrument of which is being used against us to repress our freedoms, we can take control of it and we can use it to reassert and regain those freedoms. We do this by organizing. And yes, I, I, I believe that we should organize at the local level. Absolutely. However, we can use this technology to begin to not only reach people on the local level, but to expand beyond, expand ideas, look to create other party systems. The possibilities are endless. Now, I don't believe that we need to resort to terrorist tactics. I believe that peaceful protest, yes, absolutely. But I do not believe that we have to resort to any type of terrorist activities to be able to get our will at least listened to and respected. What we have to do is gain support. What we have to do is get the people to listen and wake up and support this these ideas. Because these are the ideas, these are the things that will make the difference, that will allow us to start getting our voices heard again. We, as a people, may not be able to throw the kind of money that lobbies and other businesses can throw at representatives. But what we can do is garner enough votes that we have enough voting power to make the difference. And that is the key. We're not going to be able to do it through money. We're going to do it through voting power. And to do that, we have to organize and we have to reinvigorate and we have to start voting again. But we have to create alternatives, powerful alternatives to what are out there. And that we begin and do in the organizational phase. But we have to start somewhere. I urge each and every one of you locally, get involved locally, talk to other people. Yes, you're, you're not always going to get great reception. You're going to have the people who don't see anything other than party lines. But you're going to find plenty who believe 
the way that I believe and the way that you believe. So yes, by all means, do not be afraid to take the chance. Because that is the only way that we are going to correct some of the mistakes that we've made here. I believe we can work together, all of us, liberal, conservative, and anywhere on that spectrum. The key is getting the powerful and the wealthy out of making all the decisions for us. We have to take that power back. That is the key. We have to be willing to work together and we have to be willing to compromise. Absolutely. Those things will have to be done. But nevertheless, we can utilize the technology at our fingertips to begin to reach out to others. That, that is our best method for starting, that and locally. Get involved locally, local groups, local organizations. Step away from the TV. Step away from your iPads. Unless, of course, you're producing something on your iPad, well then, by all means. Nevertheless, take the moment to avoid these little escapes that we have, these things to distract us. And take a moment to look at the big picture. And think about what we're leaving behind for our children and our grandchildren. Think about the world we're leaving behind. I would urge all of you to, there's a few websites out there to check out to just to verify a lot of the things that I've talked about. Uh, freedomhouse.org. Um, check that out. Also, a group that I have had some familiarity with, the Millennium Project. It's a uh, futures research organization that talks about all these global challenges. Of course, one of them being democratization and, and, and human rights and the, and, the, and the challenges that we're facing going forward. Get involved. Get in part and, and, and be part of the, the idea. Come up with ideas. Don't be afraid to think and act. We've been told that we can only be thinkers or we can only be actors. Well, we can be both. Don't be afraid to be both. Okay, well, that's what I have for everyone today. Uh, I know that I, I've gone a little longer than I normally do on some of my podcasts, but I feel like a, a lot of information I needed to get out there to everybody. And uh, and this is something that is very important to me and, and I think is very important to all those in the United States and in Western democracies as well. We have to reassert our freedoms and our power. Uh, next week, uh, I... Uh, uh, maybe I'll be able to get back to the cryptids. We'll see. I haven't really settled upon uh, what I'll be talking about next week, but uh, I'm sure I'll be touching on some of these other news topics as well as we go forward. Uh, once again, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming back and supporting the show. It's greatly appreciative. Uh, be sure to check out the uh, the social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Google+. Plus. Um, if, if you have any questions, email or comments, email the show webofconspiracy at gmail.com. That's two Bs in web. Um, also, uh, for those of you who like listening to the show, of course, I broadcast on Spreaker, but it's also available on Stitcher, as well as on, uh, I have a YouTube channel now dedicated to the show. So uh, if you like YouTube and that's how you prefer to listen, you can also listen to the show on YouTube. Of course, you can download the podcast on iTunes. Um, trying to expand the show as much as I can, so bear with me as uh, I kind of go through these growing pains. But got some other things planned as well going into the future. So uh, once again, thank you to everybody listening, and uh, have a great week. <laughs>